I'm about to take you on a virtual field trip where the regular public can't usually go. Behind the scenes at the DIA. Let's go check it out. We're meeting with Kathy Selvius Daru. She's a research scientist at the DIA. Oh. Hi, are you Hi. Morgan? Yeah. Oh, come on in. This is a sculpture of St. Francis, and we have questions about the history of the painted surface. This sculpture is about 400 years old, and we're interested to find out uh, the pigments that were used to paint the surface of this sculpture. What do you mean by pigments? Pigments are the colorants that are used to create a painting. The color you see on this sculpture. 400 years ago, most pigments that were used by artists were from the earth. They were mineral-based oh. that were ground up to a very fine powder and then mixed with some sort of binding medium and then painted on the surface of St. Francis or even on a painting. Now why are we looking at the pigments? Well, we, ha we have questions about the surface on St. Francis. This is paint over wood. We know that he's a wooden sculpture. And we're wondering if the painted surface that we see today is the original surface or not. The workhorse instrument is an instrument known as an X-ray fluorescence spectrometer. We typically refer to it as XRF. XRF, remember that. X-ray fluorescence spectrometer. Okay. And what it does is it gives us information about the elements in a material. And by elements I mean, is there iron in this pigment? Is there copper in this pigment? Understanding the elements present helps you figure out what pigments could likely be present. It is totally non-destructive, the technique. Nothing touches the object. Okay. We just fire a very narrowly focused x-ray beam at the surface of uh, the object. How about we check out an XRF spectrum? The x-rays will come out this little red-tipped orifice here. This is a video-guided uh, system. And the x-ray beams will hit exactly where crosshairs and uh, the laser pointer intersect. She tries to align the laser and the crosshairs together so she can get that perfect, perfect point. So I'm there. She did it. Okay. So this graph is showing us what elements are present in the paint. So how many times do you do this? Can you tell us? In the case of this particular sculpture, I took more than 20 spectra from various locations on the sculpture of St. Francis. We're looking at St. Francis's knuckle. Okay. And we're trying to figure out which pigments are present. And when I see this sort of pattern here, they indicate the presence of lead. But then there's this one here. They're very close to the lead peaks, but they're very distinctive and indicate the presence of mercury. You know, this is primarily lead white with the presence of mercury to give it that, that pinkish hue. And okay. the uh, mercury red, the mercuric sulfide red, that would have been mixed with uh, lead white to create the pink surface of his knuckle. So if we go back into uh, the XRF room and we pull St. Francis away, have another look at the knuckle okay. and you will see that There's... it's pink. So what did you ultimately learn from all the research you did on St. Francis? What we learned that the painted surface that you see on St. Francis right now yeah. is not the original surface, okay. uh, that the painted surface that you see now was applied sometime uh, around the late 18th century or later. Okay. So Kathy, what subjects does somebody have to study to do what you do? Chemistry, 
physics, biology, okay. geology, and That's then pretty much all the science, right? All, 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 all of the sciences, okay. all of the sciences influence conservation science, and then it helps to have a ferocious curiosity too. Okay. So now, take a look at that knuckle. Yeah. What do you see? Pink, mercury, it's pink. Yeah, yeah so you pink. have the mercury sulfide red mixed with the lead white yeah. to give that pinkish, that pinkish flesh tone. Thank you so much, Kathy. You know, when we look at art, we're usually only looking at the surface. But let's go take a look at what we find when we look below the surface. Hey, are you Aaron? Yeah. Hi. I'm Morgan. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yeah. So what are you up to? Actually, I just finished up doing an x-ray, so we're about to go in and process that. Cool. Can we come with you? Of course. Great. Let's go. Whoa. Look at that. <laughs> and what is this? Yeah, that's uh, our x-ray tube. It's what produces the x-ray so that we're able to uh, x-ray our art objects. It's actually really similar to what you would get at the dentist or go to the doctor to get your arm x-rayed or something like that. It doesn't look like what's at the doctor's office. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's, a, it's very similar technology, but much more strong. Yeah, imagine. So, hey, St. Yeah. Francis. Yeah. So now what are you doing? Well, this red thing underneath is where the film is for the x-ray. Oh, there's crosshairs. Yeah, so there's a little dot on the x-ray thing, and that's where the center of the x-rays come. They come down in a cone from a little circle up there. So we have to bring down the x-ray so, so that the x-ray circle goes wall. over the whole piece that we're going to do. And inside this, there's a little piece of film. Uh, in this case, this is a CR plate, which has a phosphor plate inside of it. Uh, it allows us to scan what the x-rays pick up on this and then be able to delete that information so we can reuse this over and over. Wow, cool. Yeah. So now, basically, I have to take the piece of film out of this. Okay. I'm putting the film in here, okay. and this is a specialized scanner that that can scan this specific type of film. And then once that's scanned through, it'll produce an image for us. Great. Yeah. And there we go. It's St. Francis. It's St. Francis, Saint Francis. Saint that's right. And you can see, you, now we can start seeing through the whole thing. You can see some, there's a large oh nail in goodness. there. And you can see in his head, there's a, there's a big screw up in his head. And I'll zoom in here for you so you can see it. You can see these pegs down at the very bottom too. And those are really important because it tells us how he sits. You can see how mm. the pegs go all the way inside here. Right. So we know how he would have sat I'm on his there. pedestal. And up here in his head is really interesting because you can see he's got a big plate in his head yes. with some screws and a plate on top. And uh, do you have any idea what that might be for? Maybe to hang it up? Uh, no, no, see, we saw the pegs on the, the ground, so he sits. Okay. But if what do you normally see when you've got a, uh, a saint or something like that? What are, the, what are oh, they? Oh, a halo. Yeah, they've got their halo. <laughs> but since this is a sculpture, we have to attach that halo somehow. Step so away. this is the plate that would have eventually had the halo put in. But Aaron, can you please tell us why you're using this x-ray to x-ray St. Francis or any other type of art? Well, there's lots of reasons actually that we would want to x-ray something. There's art historical reasons. Uh, so if we're trying to figure out where this came from, we want to, we want to, maybe we can find something on the inside. It might be a signature. It could be a, mm. a specific way, a specific artist built things that we can't see on the outside of the sculpture. But if we look through it, we might be able to see that. So like we were talking about with the peg down here, um, you know, we take this sculpture and we put it on exhibit. We go up to the galleries and we put it out there and it sits for years and years and years and years. So when we, when I x-ray in here, I want to make sure that that peg doesn't have a crack in it, isn't right. broken, that there's not all rotten in there. Otherwise, we would want to build a different type of secure point for it so that it can stay up and be preserved for as long as we can. So there's some historical, artistical, mm -hmm. and practical reasons That's for exactly right. this x-ray. There's also a lot of discovery that goes on yes. in, in practice like this too. Discovery and curiosity. Curiosity. That's right. That's right. <laughs> now, I'm a little distracted, Aaron. What is that? <laughs> That's actually X radiography, too. Okay. It's just a different way of doing it. Okay. So, uh, come over here and I'll show you. So, this is X radiography, too, just done yeah. in a slightly different way. Uh, this actually uses X ray film instead okay. of an X ray phosphor plate. Okay. It, the, the techniques are very similar, but 
But one thing I wanted to call your attention to here is, are these, uh, the nails that you see in here, right? You see all these white parts in here, and those are really dense, right? Like right. we were talking about before, because they're metal. Right. And, but do you notice anything weird about all these? Anything that, anything that weird about them? Different shapes, and some of these are bent. Mm -hmm. yeah. we, and, and the key with that is that they all look different. And we're given a date that comes from a time when they shouldn't have factory made nails. Okay. You know, it helps us confirm our information that we have in the past. So once again, we find out that it's not just about what we see on the surface. It's also about using machines like the x-rays and the infrared to see what's inside, what's beneath the surface, and what's actually being made up of all these materials. Yeah. We answer questions that come from art historians. We, it answers questions about the condition of the piece and yes. how long it can last. It's not just art at the art museum. Remember that, Aaron. Uh, definitely, <laughs> I, will. I do not forget that. The Last Judgment was a European painting by Jan Provost almost 500 years ago. Today, it's one of the DIA's most prized possessions, and it's been in their collection since 1889. And it's worth a lot of money. A lot. Let's look at this painting, Morgan. This is the painting of The Last Judgment. This painting is sort of a moral guide. A painting like this was created not only for churches, but even for places like courtrooms. This is a very, very complicated painting. What you see is Christ is top and center here is St. John the Baptist. And over here on the opposite side is the Virgin Mary. Down in the left is St. Peter, who holds the keys to the kingdom of heaven. However, we have precisely the opposite going on here. The evil people are being herded into this, the fiery mouth of this monster yeah. here. What exactly did you learn? What did you find? Well. I used X-ray fluorescence, XRF. XRF. It's non-destructive, you don't yes. take a sample. And so I acquired spectra from many different locations right. on this painting okay. to learn about the elements in the pigments. All right, so let's check it out. So let me show you one of these mineral pigments that I was telling you about that Jan Provost uh, would have used to create the painting, The Last Judgment. Here are mineral examples of azurite. Okay. This mineral would have been taken from the earth okay. and then ground. And what I have here are two vials. So cool. Each contain azurite. Okay, so this one is ground a little bit more coarse than this one. This one is I can tell that the particles are a little smaller and then this one is a darker blue yeah. than this blue. Can, you, can you see? The, the, the more coarsely ground azurite sparkles. Yeah, it sure does. Can you see the way it catches the light? It, sure it also does. sparkles. And the particle sizes range in size from the smallest being uh, 63 microns up to 100. So the microns so, are how large they are? Yes, the yes, the size microns. of the particles. So let's go over to the computer screen and I'll show you what these azurite particles of two different size ranges look like under the microscope. All right, let's check it out. Okay, have a look in the microscope, right. Morgan. And wow. you can see what compressed yes. azurite looks like. It's not very blue, is it? There, we, No, it's not. It's not, it's like a greenish, yellowish. If you look on the stage, you can see the visible light shining. Yes. Okay, and then when you turn it into infrared mode, you can't see infrared light. Sure. So we're setting up a vibration in the material. Mm -hmm. This is the molecular fingerprint of azurite. Of azure. And these are the carbonate vibrations in here. And if you're not entirely certain, we have um, a database of more than a thousand artists' materials and we can search the database. So this is showing us the comparison between what we just got off of this slide mm -hmm. and, and what you have in your database, database. to and show that azurite. this is, is in azurite. fact azurite. Guess what guys, we found azurite. Let's take a look, Morgan, at what the particles from these vials, the azurite particles, look like under the microscope. So, so this gives you a visual 
comparison of how finely a pigment is ground influences the shade of the color. What we just saw was that you can take the same mineral and depending on how finely it's ground, you can get two different colors. Two different and shades even of blue. Two right. different shades of blue right. and if it's more coarsely ground, you still get a little sparkle. That's my That's favorite. Right. I like the sparkle. Now, let's take a look okay. at the XRF analysis okay. of The Last Judgment. All right. Okay. The one that I would like to focus on was obtained from uh, the Virgin Mary's shoulder, her blue robe. Okay. And here is lead, Okay. In, which you've seen before, you expected right? It. You expected, expected it. To see the lead. Absolutely, yeah. because it's been used for millennia. Right. Okay. And look at this huge copper peak. So when I see the presence of copper in a blue area, mm -hmm in a painting of this age, 500 years old, right. I'm thinking azurite. Azurite. Copper carbonate blue. Just so we're clear, you use the XRF to take an analysis of the minerals in the painting, The Last Judgment. And what you found was copper, which indicated the likely use of azurite, which was consistent with that time period. So it's, it's pretty much safe to say that the minerals used in The Last Judgment are consistent with the time period. Absolutely. Very good. Perfect. Very good. How did I do? Excellent. All right, Excellent. good. We're on a roll. Microscopes, chemistry, x-rays, infrared light, all the things you would expect to see in an art museum, right? Yeah, I didn't think so either. Let's find out what they can do with infrared light. Hey, Aaron. What are you doing now? Why is it so bright in here? <laughs> well, I'm doing infrared reflectography, IR photography for short. Uh, it, these IR. lights actually are producing a lot of light. They're really hot and they're really bright. Yes, they are. But there's some light coming out of them that you can't see. It's in the infrared part of the spectrum. When we look at a rainbow, we see all of the colors. But there is parts of the light spectrum that go beyond what, we can, what we can see. There's UV that's on one side and then there's infrared that's on the other. And this camera here has a special sensor inside of it. And that sensor only can pick up light and information that's, that is in the infrared part of the spectrum. And that infrared light, when we put it onto certain paintings and it up against certain pigments, it allows the IR can actually penetrate some of the paint layers. Sometimes we can see what are called underdrawings or underpaintings, where you can see through the painting and maybe what the artist had sketched out beforehand. You can see that there are all these trumpets that are that are in dark here. Wait. But when you look on there, there's there's five trumpets, but on this right. one, there's six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven of them. You know, the the artist when he was sketching out the his his idea for this painting, he was sketching out all these trumpets. But then when he got to the final version, he decided, eh, you know, maybe I'll only do five instead of the fifteen. And this painting actually has a lot of really fun little things that you wouldn't notice. Can you, you show some see. more? Yeah, yeah, sure. Excuse me, I'll show you real quick. Fascinating. If you look up here, there's all these rows of little angels and they're all, they all look very two-dimensional here, but what you notice on the screen is that there's not as many of them no, they're and not they're just sketched out and there's only one, two, three, four, five, six of them and they look much different than they are here. Yeah. So you can tell that the artist had the general idea of what he wanted here, but when he got to the painting, he decided make it look like this. Right. What's special about this infrared technique is that we get, we get a chance to be able to see that stuff that, that the painter didn't show us at the very end. Right. So you even get to down see here, the process from beginning to end. On yeah, uh, this guy's foot, you can see his foot here only goes to the edge of the drapery here. But when you look at it here, you can see that his foot actually originally was meant to be much longer than that. Wow. So the artist made that choice there. He was he was working on this idea even all the way up to the point where he was painting it. So that's really interesting. So one other little spot here is this is this kind of monstery looking figure here. And you can see that his leg is bent here on the in the final painting. Right. But when you look on the on the part right here, you can see his leg originally was, was spread out, out much more. So it's like an infrared treasure hunt. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And one, and one other thing really interesting about it is that when you see things with the infrared light, 
you start to look at the painting in a different way. Yeah. I still I still really enjoy looking at art, but I actually get to add on this little bit of information. Like I said, it's kind of a discovery. It's kind of an exploration of yeah. the art. And now we can start looking at the art and you're looking at it for different reasons than you did right. before. So what I'll do is I'll, sh I'll go over to this other computer and I'll show you the whole painting at once instead of just little spots at a time. So we can we can take a look at it. All right, let's right. look at the infrared puzzle. <laughs> So now this is all of those little pictures all put together into the form of one. So we have the, the regular light and then we have the infrared light right here. Yeah. You can see all of the sketching. It was, this wasn't painted at, you know, all at one. You know, this was sketched out and everything was very deliberate, which is really nice to see. And again, like I said, we can look at other works by the same artist and compare them to see how they worked and to see if maybe when he was younger he did one way and maybe he was older he did another. Right. There's all sorts of fun art historical questions we can ask, as well as, like we were talking uh, before, you know, it's about validating the information we have already. Exactly. Some things, some come to us and say, hey, there's a, you know, there's an underdrawing underneath this, and right. well, we, have, we have to check to see if there actually is an underdrawing. Yeah. So this technique uh, can confirm some of that information. That's what's so great about being able to look beneath the surface. You sort of get a complete picture, mm -hmm. whereas you don't get the complete picture looking solely at the surface or looking solely beneath the surface. So you really help to create the whole picture. No, that's that's why that's why I work here. Is I get to add <laughs> information. So there's the stuff that's on view, and then I get to take these special. Uh, images that allow us to see all the rest of the information right. or whatever else we can gather. The cameras I have can actually, I can take them to the gallery because there are sometimes, wow. you can imagine in my room here, it's not very big, but there's artwork yeah. bigger than my room. Right. So I have to be able to travel to that work to be able to do the same type of work out in the gallery or out on the road or in another country or another museum even. So you're walking through the gallery looking at everything we can't see in our natural eye with your infrared camera. That's right. Wow. Thank you so much, Aaron, for teaching us about infrared reflectography. I had so much fun. Did you have fun? I had fun. Did you have fun? I had fun. Yeah. All right. You should come back anytime. Oh, it's fun. you got an invitation to come back. <laughs> you remember that. That's fun. Okay, don't forget. Don't forget. You know, it's amazing to think that this much science and technology goes into an art museum. And I bet they've only just begun to scratch the surface of what all is out there to discover. We hope you enjoyed today's virtual field trip. And you know what? Maybe you'll be our next great scientist. Funding for this project is provided by Community Telecommunications Network.